that she's extra back. Extra. <laughs> she's back. 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 She's back.
I'm good with that. We got it through spring break and all the all the people have gone home now, so we're good. For those of you who read it, the new These Days is out. It's in the narthex up here, so if you're at home or if you're with us and you read These Days, come by and, and pick, pick that copy up. I want to keep the One Act by District group in prayer this week. They go to, well, the One Act play troop goes to by District competition this week. I can actually put those words together if I try hard enough. Uh, they will go this Wednesday to Rankin, and it will be a very long day. So they rehearse at 10 o'clock, so we're leaving at 7, and then they perform at 7, right? 7 p.m. Well, you can't make that exact determination, but we're last. You're last, right, so an estimation. So Could be so anywhere fun. between 5 and 7. So we'll probably get in at 2 or 3 in the morning, so anyway. I did not get added to the prayer list. Uh, Bob, who had a stroke last week, did want to keep him on the, on the prayers. I didn't get him on the physical list because, frankly, I lost my list last week. So, and then found it this morning. That's what I know. What do y'all know? Let's worship back. <clears throat> season of Lent, the time to examine our hearts and our lives. And journey with Christ, 
through the suffering of the world. Let us seek God with our whole hearts. And treasure God's word in our spirits. God has marked us as beloved dust. And called us together to worship. Good and gracious and almighty God, as we come together, we give you thanks and honor and praise and glory that we're here together in this space, some of us for the first time in a year. We give you thanks and honor and praise and glory that we have this space in this nation where we are free to worship you. And so we ask now that you would help us to not take that for granted. Help us to center ourselves in you. Help us to focus only on you. That we might be refreshed and renewed and prepared to go out of the world and praise your holy name to the rest of the world. Share your love and your grace with everyone we meet. For we pray it in Jesus' holy name and let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.
be illumined by it. <clears throat> Good and gracious and almighty God, we turn now to these words written down so many generations ago, giving you thanks for those you inspired to write them, for those you inspired to canonize them, for those you inspired to protect them and bring them to us. And so now we pray that you would help us to see beyond these written words and to see far beyond the always inadequate words of the one who preaches that we might see and hear and know and come to believe your true word made flesh. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus, life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fevered cries and tears to the one who could save him from the death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, and was designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A responsive reading is in your bulletin, Psalm 119. 9 through 16. How can young people keep their way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Do not let me stray from your commandments. I treasure your word in my heart, so that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the ordinances of your mouth. I delight in the way of your decrees as much as in all multitudes. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Melchizedek is a rough one, Jim. <laughs> but like I always say, it's transliter transliterated Greek. So in 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm the only one in the room that knows you mis mispronounced it. So don't worry about it. Just say it like you mean it, because I don't care. <laughs> I didn't have <laughs> No, Kizadek. Our gospel reading this morning is from the gospel according to John chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Would you rise with me, please, in honor of reading the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went to Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The time has come that the Son of Man be glorified. For very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls onto the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their lives will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep, will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, there will be my servant also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. <clears throat> now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it's for this reason that I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven 
I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now it is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I will be lifted up from the earth and will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he would die. Friends in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. So you've heard the cliche, I'm sure. It's all Greek to me. You heard that, right? It's a thing we say, or a thing we... Uh, like to turn to when we see or hear a thing we have no way of understanding at all. Trust me, the way I actually learned Greek and the way I learned Hebrew, uh, it was rough back in the day. They used to teach it this way, they don't anymore, but uh, we used to learn basic Hebrew in four weeks and we learned Greek in six weeks. All the heavy evangelical stuff happened in semesters that followed, but the basics of the language were learned in intensive courses in four and six weeks. And during that time, you did nothing but study until you kind of passed out, and then you woke up and studied some more until you passed out again. Stessa will likely tell you that I was not much of a husband at that time. She's shaking her head no for those of you who are not here. Uh, and not that that's gender specific, I promise that the, the, the females in the class were probably not great wives at the time ever if they were married. When you walk into class the first day as a graduate student and you realize, oh wow, I don't even know the alphabet. The term, it's all Greek to me, rolls off the tongue with extreme ease. It's a term we use when we are so very lost in the unfamiliar because we look for things to say when we're uncomfortable. And we all feel uncomfortable when we're surrounded with the, that which we do not know. The other thing we do when things are unfamiliar is to do our best to find something, anything, that is familiar. It makes us feel safer. So when these Greeks, these Gentiles, come to Bethsaida, they are deeply in Jewish country. They're going to the Jewish city, the distinctly Jewish city of Jerusalem, to observe a distinctly Jewish tradition, the Passover. They're way out of their comfort zone. They don't know what to do, and so they go to the familiar to feel safe. Philip is a distinctly Greek name. So they go to him. They go with the guy that's like them. And they tell him, we've heard about this guy named Jesus and we want to see him and they want to meet him. And Philip takes them to another person with a Greek name, Andrew. And Andrew and Philip go together to bring them to Jesus. So they go to the familiar and gather with people who are familiar. It's what we all do. It's human nature. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's safe for us to be around people that are like us. But I think there's a particular lesson to be applied to it these days. You see, these Gentiles, these Greeks are in fact seeking the familiar, but they are about to dive into something that's incredibly unfamiliar to them. This story comes right on the heels of Palm Sunday. The great procession is just about to happen. The Passover is coming, and they're going to be part of that. And even though they have absolutely no experience with it, all the traditions and rituals and food will be strange to them. They're strangers in a strange land. And while they're seeking out people to be with who will make that more comfortable for them, they are, in fact, stepping way outside their comfort zone. And today, we don't do much of that. 
We don't like to be uncomfortable. We don't do nearly enough of it. And there's a danger in it. There's a big danger. Our comfort zones can become echo chambers where we only see what we want to see and we only hear what we want to hear and the only opinions we want to acknowledge are the ones that we, with which we agree. There's a danger in that. One of the things that happens every year at a camp meeting, by golly, I'm hoping we get back there this year, uh, and I think we are. I think we're getting back there from all the things I'm hearing. One of the things that's, that's challenging for me uh, is that I have to go as a superintendent, I go to every single worship service. Now for a lot of y'all, that might sound like punishment uh, because there's a lot of them and I hear every sermon. And uh, I tell you, sometimes it does seem like punishment on occasion. I have heard some of what, in my opinion, to be the worst theology I have ever heard in my life from the pulpit in the tabernacle. I will be absolutely honest with you about that. But it's just that. It's my opinion about that theology. I've heard a lot of sermons with which I could not disagree more. And I can make a decision in the midst of that as I'm participating in those sermons, I can choose to be angry about what's been said. I can choose to be angry about that person who preached that thing with which I disagree. I can focus on how wrong I think that preacher is. I can decide to not be in a relationship with them just beyond just a typical working relationship. Or I consider, can consider our disagreement to be a challenge to my own way of thinking. It's not enough for me to simply say, I disagree with that nonsense this person just offered me. I can mumble under my breath what an idiot I think that person is. Or, I have options, don't I? I can ask myself why I disagree with what they say. I can hold what they say up against my understanding of what I know of Scripture. <clears throat> Specifically, I can hold that up against what I hear Jesus saying to me in Scripture, and I can consider what background that person might have uh, to have a different, to give them a differing point of view than me, and what experiences of my own life that have led me to this place, to my own stance on this issue. Does that have to lead to an agreement on a particular subject? No, <laughs> and it seldom does. But I should be able to look my fellow Christian in the eye and consider that neither one of us knows everything there is to know about God, and neither one of us truly knows the will of God, and we can walk away, friends, disagreeing with one another, but still being faithful to God in that process. And I suppose there's another thing I can really think about in the midst of all of that. Maybe I should be constantly asking myself this question, as we all should, and this is going to shock you. There exists the possibility. Hold on. There exists the possibility that I could be wrong. <laughs> Did you know that? <clears throat> I'm learning that. <laughs> Is it possible that I could be challenged by a person with whom I disagree and actually learn something about myself? It may be even about my relationship with God. Is it possible that I can grow in my own faith through that challenge? It seems to me that most people these days hear something with which they disagree, and instead of truly trying to hear it, we automatically see red. We put up our dupes and we're ready to fight. We gather around those people 
who agree with everything we might find familiar and we listen to them and they listen to us and the echo chamber grows louder and louder and louder until all we hear is the sound of our own voices mixing with those other voices who just want to scream at the other side and it sounds like thunder. When God spoke in the midst of those confused and gathered Greeks, they were in such a frenzy that they thought they heard thunder. And I can't help but think that in such a time as this, we Christians of every stripe should stop and listen before we formulate a response, and especially before we form words, and especially before we form hateful and hurtful words. Are we listening for the voice of God? Are we hearing the voice of God? Are we hearing thunder? Are we just hearing this cacophony of voices in our own realm? Are we truly listening to one another and seeking how God is choosing for us to be in relationship with one another? I have all but quit social media lately. Sometimes I'll log into it maybe once or twice a week, but even in those short bursts of reading it and what I see in the news and what I hear people say, just walking by conversations at tables over coffee, I hear anger and I hear hate. And most of the time, it's based in untruth. Or more of the time, it's based in half-truths. <clears throat> it's not new. Here's something I learned recently. When Abraham Lincoln was elected president, Abraham Lincoln, y'all, 1860, he had never spoken a single word against slavery in the South. Did you know that? He thought from the South that was specifically a state's right issue. He wasn't speaking about that. <clears throat> what he had spoken against is the exp expansion of slavery into new states, like Kansas was becoming a state. He didn't think that was right. He thought, you know, we, we ought to at least keep it tempered down to the states. But he never said a word about slavery in the South. But right after his election, months before his inauguration, did you also know that we used to inaugurate presidents on March 4th? I didn't know that either, but it used to be two months longer, that nonsense that we put up with. All over the news, all across the South, it was stated that <clears throat> once Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated, he was going to kill or imprison all white men and that all of their wives and daughters were going to be given, or the slaves would be set free, and all of the wives and daughters of these white men that are now dead would be given to those slaves as slaves. That way it wasn't nearly in that kind of clean language. That was all over the news in the South. He never said a word about it. It was all over the place. It's not new. All stuff has been going on a long time. People have believed it, been believing their own version of the truth as long as the truth has been around for a long, long time. And when I hear it, and when I hear it based on falsehood, I hear the words from John 4. Y'all strap in. Because Jesus is fixing to say something here. Whoever claims to love God and hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. They're liars. We don't get to hate. Period. 
Those are the words of Jesus. It ain't thunder. It's Jesus. And it's certainly not me. They're the words of Jesus himself. I hope and I pray every day, particularly during Lent, this is my thing this year, I hope and I pray every day for a kinder and gentler world. I hope and I pray every day that as we as a nation will learn to listen to one another. And I pray every day that we'll stop listening to only one side of the story and calling it the whole story. And I pray every day that we will learn to love one another better. That we will find peace where there seems to be no peace. That's my Lenten prayer. What's yours? Let's pray. Almighty and merciful God, we turn now to you asking that you would enter our lives and help us to hear beyond the thunder. Help us to hear your voice. Guide us to your peace. Help us to hear one another and stop believing nonsense. Help us to stop going off half-cocked due to half-truths. Lead us and guide us into your way that this world might be kinder and gentler and that we might love each other better. For we pray it in the name of the one who called us a liar, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and say we believe using the Apostles' Creed as printed in the bullet. <coughs> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And sit upon the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
especially all of his friends, our brothers and sisters, worshiping right now down the street at the Baptist Church. We pray for the families of Bob and Robert and Huey, so many others that have <clears throat> suffered loss, especially in this time in this last year. We pray, O oh God, for our friend Bob, who suffered a stroke, whose wife Krista sits by his side holding his hand. Hear her prayers. Heal him and make him whole. Guide the doctors who treat him the nurses who work every day to show their kindness. We pray for a young child named Harper. May those headaches go away and may that child be allowed to play. And we pray for Tiffany. Tiffany, who has lymphoma in no way of really understanding what lymphoma is, but is having to go through the treatment for lymphoma. We pray for Tiffany. We give you thanks that Sandra is feeling better and back at work. And we pray again for the Rubio family. Not only have they lost a father and a husband, but a home and all their belongings, we pray for we give you thanks that Gerardo continues to be on the mend and that Barbara is able to spend so much time with her grandbaby and do her physical therapy and heal. We pray for Colton as his brain heals. For Alex and her family who are four-fifths with us today, giving you thanks for young Tommy and the joy he brings even as the grief carries on. We pray for Mary Beth and for Bill and Michael as they are temporarily and by design separated. We ask that you would keep Bill safe and make this move be as easy as possible. For Charlie, oh God, seven-year-olds don't deserve cancer. Heal it. Let it play. For Michelle, who continues to take her treatments and do so with a smile, For Catherine and Jean and Marjorie and Emily, we give you thanks for their wisdom and we give you special thanks that Pat and Kimball are with us today. For we have missed them. We pray for Caleb and all those who have suffered senseless violence. For John and for Linda. For Eddie and Julie as they await word of transplant. For Alice and Rudy as they face life anew every day. Merciful God, we pray these things and many, many others, either silently or aloud. We pray for the Bolting House family whose mother, Stephen's mother, passed away on Monday to help them get through this time. And special prayers for all drug addiction in our area, but particularly the victims of methamphetamine, for those who are caught up in that addiction and for the victims of violence that they perpetrate when they lost their mind on that drug. Help us find a way through that. 
can help those people, help us find a way to deal with those people and get them well. Hear these prayers of God. And hear us as we lift up one voice and pray together the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ taught all of his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the time when we typically take up an offering. Uh, you will find if you're in the room, offering plates in the back. Uh, if you're not in the room with us, if you're worshiping up with us uh, at home, <coughs> we uh, invite you to give in other ways. We have a lock box in the narthex. Our PO box number is box 832 in Fort Davis, 79734. And um, Mary Will and Jay Fred. Um, we have a donate button, but y'all at home can't see the cuteness, so we, I'm, I'm just being distracted. Um, we have a donate button on our website, fortdavispcusa.org. And uh, finally, what Stess and I have done for many years is just to allow uh, the church to automatically draft our funds each month. So uh, knowing that these gifts are coming, knowing that your, uh, your generosity is overwhelming, we sing praises to God.